Good morning. How is everybody? Good? I asked that at our uh, added 7 a.m. service, and it was just, uh, it was placid. It was just, I was kind of placid as well. I wasn't quite awake at, at, at the 7 a.m. service. Glad you guys are here. So um, two things, well, I guess three things. One, welcome. It's, it's Easter, which is a really, really big deal. And if you've never been to church here, you're amongst good people, and um, so I'm really, really glad you're here. So have something that's really, really stupid that I want to share with you, and then I have an important thing to share with you, and then a lesson. So the stupid thing is this, um, because we're fun around here. I'm particularly fun, so let me share you this this story. <laughs> so I have a bad habit around the house. I leave uh, cups of like half-drank water. If you've ever seen the movie Signs, that little girl, I'm not quite that bad, but I, I will drink a glass of water, and I hate wasting things, even water, so I'll and I don't want to rewash. I'm, I've become kind of like a somewhat of an environmentalist. So I'm like, well, we have to wash those glasses and we're wasting all, you know, anyway. So I've become that guy. And um, so I'll use like the same cup a lot. And, and you can judge me for that, but whatever. Anyways, so I left a half glass of water by our two couches by our back door where we let our dog in and out all the time to use the, the bathroom by our backyard. And, and so I woke up one morning this last week, and I take my oldest daughter to school Monday through Thursday, and uh, I'm always waiting on her because she's a teenager, and uh, I'm waiting on her to get ready, and my allergies are really, really bad one morning, and so I go, and I get an Allegra, and I got the Allegra in my hand, pop it in my mouth, and I'm like, well, I got to wash it down with something, so I go over and see this glass that I left out the night before right there by the door, and what I surmise happened was in one of my dog's frequent trips out, a bug had flown in because when I took a drink of the water, uh, there was something moving in my mouth, and it was a bug. And so I spit it out, and I was about to throw up because it was still alive. And then it hit me, that's not the first time I have drank a bug. Uh, the, the first time <laughs> first time was about a year ago in the middle of the summer. Uh, I've got a couple of old cars. I like working on old cars. And I was driving one of my old cars and it was running really, really terribly and I pulled over into the BP on the corner of Thompson Lane and Broad and I pulled up under the thing, it was hot, middle of summer, it was like 95 degrees, old cars don't have any air conditioning, I'm sweating, I had bought this huge glass bottle of Coca-Cola because that's what you drink when you drive an old car and so um, pop the hood, I'm sitting there trying to work on it, get it going. I'm out there for like 30 minutes. I'm covered to grease up to my elbows and finally get the car running right and fi figure out what's wrong with it. And so I hop in and I take a big swig of my soda that's been sitting there, not knowing that a wasp had gotten into it. So I take a drink, something in my mouth, that's that, something that's not very happy, stung my tongue. And so my, my reaction was I threw down the bottle and uh, it's glass, so it broke. And there's soda and broken glass all over this BP in this area. And so I got to clean that up. And the whole time my tongue is rapidly swelling. So I clean up the glass because I don't want anyone to run over the glass and throw it away. And I go inside <laughs> covered in grease. My tongue is swelling. I go over and I get like the big like 64 ounce soda cup and I fill it completely with ice. And I just put like, you know, <laughs> like a little bit of soda in there to make it taste like something. And I'm going to let the swelling on my tongue go down. And I go up to the front with this big thing and the cashier's eyes are just huge. And he goes, hey, it's on the house, pastor. I saw, I saw the whole thing. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I couldn't, I couldn't talk. I just went, blah, blah, blah. And, I, and I just walked out. That was the first time I drank a bug. Second time was earlier this week. Okay, that's the dumb stuff. We got that out of the way, right? The serious stuff is this. Um, if you're new to the church, what we typically do here is we go through whole books of the Bible. We're in a book of the Bible in the New Testament right now called 1 Corinthians, which is um, pretty exciting to teach, a pretty interesting book of the Bible. We were in chapter 11 last week, and what I do is every week I'll kind of put like a thesis up here, basically something we're going to talk about throughout the course of the lesson. Last week, our, our thesis from the first half of chapter 11 in, in 1 Corinthians is that our attempt in our culture to make a God in our image, which means that can be us or we can make up kind of a manufactured version of Jesus to, to fit our needs. Us doing that in our society and our culture is not working for us. Every college university that is doing studies, every think tank, every survey that you see 
we have become a more aggressive people, a more depressed people, um, a more angry and divided people, our ways are not working. That's basically what we talked about last week. And we'll get back to 1 Corinthians this coming weekend. Because this week is special, I'm gonna do things a little bit differently than what I normally do. I'm gonna jump from the book of Luke to the book of Matthew to the book of Romans. So I'm jumping around a little bit, not too far. Those books are all pretty close together, right? And it's all gonna be the same theme, but I'm gonna be teaching a little bit differently than I normally teach. And here's the topic we're gonna be talking about because of the fact that it is Easter weekend. We're gonna be talking about the significance of the resurrection of Jesus. Specifically, we're gonna be talking about an, a, a part of the resurrection or before the resurrection about this veil of the temple that the Bible says was ripped apart when Jesus died. And we're gonna focus on this little bitty, interesting little nuance in some of the scripture we're gonna be reading today, okay? So if you're in here and you're not a believer, the resurrection is at the core of Christianity. And my hope today is that I will show you a little bit from the Bible. It'll just be like a 30,000 foot view. We're not gonna go super deep today, but hopefully, hopefully something you hear today will be provocative to you. And even if you've been a Christian for a long time, I hope that something I say or something we read is provocative you, to, to, to you and helps you uh, want to explore a little bit more, okay? So you should have got a notes handout when you walked in. Everything I'm gonna say is in there. Everything will be on the screens all around the room. If you have a smartphone, the Experience Community app, if you download that, just click on Sermon Notes. Everything is right there. And if you have a physical copy of the Bible, Luke, Matthew, Romans, in that order, that's where we'll be kind of hopping around, okay? So I'm gonna pray. We will dive into this. I'm the only thing keeping you from eating peeps, and so um, I'll, be as, I'll be as brief as I can and still not rob you of a good lesson, hopefully. Maybe I'm just the one that wants to go home and eat peeps. So my wife still gets me an Easter basket, so I'll just go ahead and confess that. I drink bugs, and I still like peeps. So uh, <laughs> let's pray. Father, Lord, we love you. God, we thank you so much, Lord. Thank you for everyone in this room this morning. Thank you, God, that we have the freedom and the liberty and um, the opportunity, God, to come in and worship you freely. Uh, thank you, God, for your word that gives us direction. Thank you, God, for your son that gave his life and resurrected for us. I pray, Lord, for everyone in this room. I pray, Lord, not just for our church, though. We pray for our other campuses. We pray for all of the different churches in this city and in the other cities where we have campuses. And we pray, God, that we can be the light and the salt of the world that you have called us to be Lord, I pray that everything we do today, that not only that it blesses us, but it honors you. We love you, we thank you, we praise you. Pray all these things in your son's name, God, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm gonna start in the book of Luke. I'm gonna read a couple of verses and I'll go back and just kind of break them down just a little bit. Well, again, we're not gonna get too deep, okay? This is what Luke writes. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb bringing the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in, but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. These were angels. So the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? asked the men. He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, it is necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day. And they remembered his words. So if you've never picked up the Bible and read it before, right, whether you're a believer or a non-believer, if you decide to do that one day and you start at the beginning, right, which is pretty courageous of you because it's tough. If you start in the beginning, the entire Old Testament, which is the first part of the Bible, is a huge flashing arrow to the idea that one day God was going to send a savior that would reconcile the broken relationship between mankind and God. Not only was God going to send a savior to reconcile this relationship, the way that that re the relationship was going to be res restored was through the death of the Savior. So because humanity had strayed so far away from God, a sacrifice had to be made. Humanity had become so evil 
that blood had to be shed. And it couldn't be the blood of just a good man or a good woman. It had to be something bigger than that. The sacrifice had to be more substantial to pay for the sins and the evil of mankind. Not just to pay for the spiritual debt that we had incurred against God, but to build a bridge across this chasm, this gap between God and his creation, which is us. So what's happening in this part that I just read to you is three days after Jesus Christ, the Savior, was crucified, he'd been in the grave for, for several days, a couple of women, they think three women, showed up with spices they had prepared. The reason they had done this is because Jesus had never received proper burial rites. So they get up super early in the morning, like I did this morning, right? It's still dark outside. They go to the tomb, and they don't know how they're gonna get this massive stone rolled away. Maybe the groundskeeper was there. Maybe some soldiers were there to move it away, but they were gonna go in hopes that they could somehow get into the tomb of Jesus and perform proper burial rites. So they get there, and they're kind of shocked because they're like, oh, the tomb is open, right? The stone is moved. And so they go a little bit closer, they go into the tomb, and there is no body there laying there. Jesus is not there. And as there is, I, I like what Luke wrote, as they were perplexed, two angels showed up. And it says that they fell down, right? Because whenever you read about people encountering angels in the Bible, it's not like, oh, cool, there's an angel. It says that they were terrified. They would fall down. It says they bowed down to the ground, right? Couldn't even look at them. They were so bright. And these angels said, I love this, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. You know what's fascinating? The women should have known that this was going to happen. When Jesus was still alive, if you have a Bible, that's why those red letters are in there. Jesus told his disciples over and over again, look, hey, they're gonna arrest me, they're gonna kill me, but I'm not gonna stay dead, I'm gonna resurrect. And he told his disciples this directly, but they forgot and all the emotion and all the chaos of the crucifixion, they forgot about it. But here's the thing, Jesus's death is not as much the key to our restoration as it is Jesus's resurrection. We often talk about his death and that's a good thing, but the death doesn't mean so much if Jesus stayed dead because good men and women can die for other people. We have men and women who, who fight for our country that have given their lives for freedom, right? You might have people in your own family that sacrifice themselves. Like, you know, maybe they've even given organs or maybe they've, they've put themselves, they've taken a bullet for someone that was being shot at or whatever the case may be. Good men and women can do that. We can sacrifice our lives for other people's physical lives, but only the son of God could make a sacrifice that would restore people's souls. But it's not just about the death, it's about the resurrection. He was also raised from the grave in order that we could be recipients of the Spirit of God. So one day, we don't just spiritually resurrect, we will literally eternally resurrect. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll talk about that here in a little bit. But this opening section is simply this, to establish that all of Christianity, if you're in here and you're not a believer, I'm really, really glad you're here, but, but you should know that all of Christianity hinges on the belief that not only did Jesus die and was in the ground three days, but that he resurrected. And he resurrected for the forgiveness of our sins. That is the bedrock of the Christian faith. So as a Christian, if you are a Christian in here, it is not enough for us to believe that Jesus was just a good guy. He was more than that. He is the creator God. He is the savior of mankind. So what am I saying? Without the resurrection, there is no Christianity. Without the resurrection, there is no salvation. Without the resurrection, there is no hope for any of us. But let's go back a little bit, right? Let's, let's read a little bit about what led to the resurrection. If you go to the book of Matthew, we're in chapter 27, and we'll read two different parts from this chapter. This is starting in verse 32. As they were going out, they found a Cyrenian man named Simon. He was an African Jew. They forced him to carry Jesus's cross. When they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, they gave Jesus wine mixed with gall to drink. But when he tasted it, 
he refused to drink it. After crucifying him, they divided his clothes by casting lots. Then they sat down and they were guarding him there. Above Jesus' head, they put the charge against him in writing. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Then two criminals were crucified with him, one on the right, one on the left. Those who passed by were yelling insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked Jesus and said, he saved others, but he can't save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he takes pleasure in him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, even the criminals who were crucified with him taunted him. So most people have never really heard of crucifixion outside of the story of Jesus. But in fact, crucifixion was something that the Roman Empire had been doing for a long time. What crucifixion was, was it was the Roman Empire's kind of masterpiece of brutality. It was the most brutal, humiliating way that you could punish a criminal and hopefully deter crime in the future. So again, crucifixion wasn't just a death. It was the worst death imaginable. It was a slow, humiliating, painful death. Typically, when people were crucified, you would eventually die either from suffocation, you would have to push yourself up to get a breath and then, and then go back down and eventually your body would just wear out and you would suffocate. Or you would have cardiac arrest, you would have heart failure, or just loss of blood. Now in Jerusalem, where Jesus was arrested, that was a Roman province, the Jews kind of ran it, but the Romans were above them. What the Roman soldiers would do is they would take out people they were gonna crucify, they would take them outside the city limits, they would go up on a hill called Golgotha, and they would crucify them next to a road that came in and out of Jerusalem. And that was, that was for a couple of reasons. One, it didn't have this barbaric scene right downtown, but it also deterred people as they came in and out of the city. What happens if I commit crime? This happens if I commit crime. And so Jesus was taken to this area where they would crucify criminals, right? And he hung on the cross. Now, again, if you're reading the Bible, let's say, again, you're courageous, you pick this book up and you just read it from, from front to back. Or let's say you even start in the book of Matthew. It's your first time, which is where I recommend you start. If you read the book of Matthew and you read about the wonderful, beautiful things about Jesus, you don't even have to be a believer that he was the son of God to see that he was absolutely amazing. The things he said were brilliant. The wonderful things he did for the poor and impoverished and for people on the fringe of society. When you read about Jesus, and if you are a Christian, you understand that he's not just a good man, that he is the son of God, that he is divine. Why did such a barbaric thing have to happen? He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't break any laws. He didn't sin. And in fact, they said that, that typically they would write the crime above people's head who were crucified. Jesus' only crime was that he claimed to be the king of the Jews, which he was. The real reason that Jesus was crucified, listen to this, the real reason Jesus was crucified, not because he'd done anything wrong, but because God came to earth and told humanity that their way was leading to destruction, that their way wasn't working. And because humanity is often arrogant and we don't like to be told that we're wrong, instead of listening with humility, we crucified him. We put him on a cross. It wasn't just that though. Jesus' death has been prophesied, foretold, ever since the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter three, right after Adam and Eve sinned and put this distance between God and man, God makes a promise to the devil, one day I'm gonna send someone that's gonna crush you, right? That's gonna put you in your place. And though it was awful, and though it was horrific and barbaric, that not only an innocent man had to die, but the son of God had to go through this. It was a necessary thing. It had to happen. 
Why did it have to happen? It had to happen because we had incurred, like I said earlier, this massive debt. Humanity had done so many evil things. And I find it interesting, and it's not a coincidence, it's not accidental, that Jesus wasn't crucified alone. He was crucified in the middle of humanity. There was a human on his right and on his left. And there was the son of God right in the middle of them. And this is no accident. There was this physical representation of something very spiritual that was taking place. That God inserted himself into humanity right in the middle of us, right amongst the worst of us. That Jesus Christ lived a life that we are to model and emulate that, that, that how we're supposed to live is not ambiguous. Jesus gave us the perfect example. And not only that, he died for our sins. He gave up his body, he shed his blood to pay for the debt that we incurred. And here's the thing, Jesus didn't deserve it. We deserved it. When I read about the crucifixion, I don't know if anyone else is like this, if you've ever read about the crucifixion or if you've ever seen like the Passion of the Christ, which probably doesn't do a complete service to how brutal the crucifixion truly was to see. When I, when I read about the crucifixion, I think the part that bothers me the most is not the physical torture that Jesus went through. I think it was the emotional and mental torture he went through. The fact that Jesus Christ, which John says is the creator of all things, he created all things, all things were created through him, by him, for him. John says, imagine the creator of all things was being spat upon by his own creation, made fun of, mocked, humiliated, and then of course physically beaten. The reason it's important for us to know this is listen, not only did Jesus die for our sins, this is so important, Jesus took on the humiliation that we deserved. Jesus didn't deserve to be humiliated for sin. All of us in this room, if you were to go through our thoughts, if people were to see the evil things that we have entertained, we would be quite humiliated, would we not? But because Jesus took on that shame, Jesus took on that humiliation, we don't have to. He took on that agony and that pain and that anguish and that stress, so we don't have to. And the knowledge not only the fact that Jesus bore physical stripes and wounds for us, but the fact that he bore our humiliation and shame. If you have never heard that until today, this is a really good beginning of us to kind of acknowledge what God has done for us and that we should feel remorse for our sin and that we should be grateful for what Christ has done and humbled by that. If you're in this room and you claim to be a Christian, knowing how, how barbaric and catastrophic and awful the crucifixion was, knowing that it was our sins that led to that should inspire us to move away from sin. As a Christian, if I know, because Jesus didn't just die for the sins of the past, he died for the sins that were going to be committed. That means the things I did wrong. And when I understand that, it should make me wanna move away from those things because I helped put him on the cross. Let's read a little bit further. Let's go down to verse 50. But Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and he gave up his spirit. Suddenly, the curtain of the sanctuary was torn from top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and they came out of the tombs after his resurrection, entered the holy city, and appeared to many. When the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquakes and the things that had happened, they were terrified and said, truly this man was the son of God. So Jesus was on the cross roughly nine hours. After the torture, after the humiliation, Jesus hung on a cross for nine hours. Matthew says that he cried out, and not too long after that, it says he cried out again, and he gave up his spirit. That means that he breathed his last breath. He died. Now, this is interesting. Matthew records that right when Jesus, is di Jesus died, a couple of things happened. 
One, in the first thing he recorded, which we're gonna hang on for a little bit here in a minute, he said the temple veil, the, this huge curtain that hung in the temple, probably about 40 foot tall, pretty high, ripped from top to bottom. He says, right when Jesus died, the earth quaked, rocks split, and the Roman soldiers, the centurion, who would have been a, a pretty big deal, almost like a sergeant major in the army, over about 100 soldiers, it says the centurion and the soldiers with him were terrified, and they acknowledged this was no man that we just crucified. Does that like gives me chills? This was no mere mortal. Surely, truly, this was the son of God. And they acknowledged that. So let's talk about this veil though. This is fascinating. Why in the world did Matthew record that this curtain in the temple ripped? Well, this veil had been around the Jewish people for a long time. It goes all the way back to the book of Exodus. Again, if you've never picked up a Bible and read it, the book of Genesis is about the beginning. The book of Exodus is about an exit, right? Where all of the people of God who were being slaves in Egypt were brought out of Egypt by Moses and they exited their exodus on the way to what is modern day Israel. In that story, as the Jews were on their way to the promised land, Israel, God told Moses that you're to build a mobile temple, a place of worship that you can move around from place to place as you travel. In this temple, called a tabernacle, there is supposed to be a special room that houses the presence of God. Now at this time, the presence of God was kind of personified, if you will, in a big gold box called the Ark of the Covenant, right? Raiders of the Lost Ark, if you're like, what is that, right? Indiana Jones, just think that. It's a bad example, but it helps. Anyways. So there was this special room called the Holy of Holies that was a part of the temple, this is important, that people were not allowed to go into. One person once a year, that's it. But what it was is there was a curtain, four inches thick, that's a pretty thick curtain, that was very uh, intricately crafted, that hung in the temple, and it separated people from the presence of God. This is the curtain that Matthew said ripped from top to to bottom. Now what the curtain did is it symbolized a separation between God and man. And like I said earlier, this separation started a long time ago, right after mankind was created. When Adam and Eve sinned in Genesis chapter three, that put a distance between God and man. If you start reading the Bible from the beginning and you work your way through Genesis, and man, the further you get through the Old Testament, you, listen, evil is not a new thing. If you go back and read the Old Testament, you're like, man, we did some pretty weird and bad stuff all throughout the Old Testament. So what happened was the more weird and evil things that we did, that distance between God and man got bigger and bigger and bigger. But God always had a plan, and the plan was Jesus. The plan was what we were talking about today. So Moses said, right after Jesus gave his last breath, this four inch, 40 foot tall curtain, right? That symbolized the distance between us and God. It says it ripped from the top all the way to the bottom. Now, the reason why it's important that we go through the Bible line by line, verse by verse, is because if you just rush through it, you miss some pretty interesting stuff. Now, most of the time you would read this and think, well, okay, top to bottom, what's the big deal? There's a lot of interesting things about this. What this shows us is no human hand could have ripped this curtain from, from, from top to bottom. If they could rip it, you would have to start at the bottom because it was 40 feet up. There's no way you could have spontaneously done that. Why is that important? It's important because of this. This curtain was torn apart, which opened up accessibility to God. It was an invitation and the fact that it came from top to bottom showed that God was the one that tore down the dividing line between him and us. What that means is, it is not by our hands, by our work, by our good deeds that we can have a relationship with God. It is God extending graciously his hand saying, I know you're messed up. I know you have faults and failures, but I'm inviting you to get to know me. I'm inviting you to have a relationship with me. That's why little things like that are important. And then totally unrelated to everything we're talking about today, but I read it, so we have to deal with it. 
There is this part where it says, right when Jesus died, a bunch of saints who were dead were, were resurrected. Now, this is weird, and I studied the heck out of it, and there's just not much clarity, but it's in the Bible. We gotta talk about it. We believe it happened. What a lot of theologians believe is that the death of Jesus, there was this kind of spiritual ripple, like if you threw a rock in a pond, right? And that, that it, it kind of resonated, and that it said a bunch of people were raised from the dead, but it says they didn't go into the city and visit people and scare the bejesus out of them until Jesus was raised from the dead. Then they went and scared all their friends and family members. Hey, how you doing, right? And the reason a lot of theologians believe this happened was it was proof that Jesus Christ was resurrected. So when the 500 or so people who saw the resurrected Jesus told their friends, they were like, I believe you because my aunt, who was a saint, showed up, right, at about that time. Weird, but it's in there, so we address it. Okay, my favorite part. Flip on over to Romans chapter eight, starting in verse 11. Now, we're gonna end on this. What are the results? What are the, the effects of this veil that has torn? Listen to this. Paul writes this. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. So then, brothers and sisters, this is good, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh because if you live according to the flesh, you're gonna die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all those led by God's spirit are God's sons. You did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, which means father, father. The spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children also heirs, Heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. What does that mean? What Paul is referring to is that accessibility that we have with God because there is no longer a dividing line. Because Jesus died, because he resurrected, because this, this, this uh, metaphorical veil, not just the literal veil, but because this, this wall between us and God has been obliterated, the mistakes that we have made can be reversed. The veil being torn was an undoing of the separation between us and God. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the undoing of us being fearful of death. Because the Christian understands we are not bodies with souls, we are souls with bodies. That we are eternal beings. That we don't have to be afraid of death, right? That we have overcome death by having a relationship with Christ. So what does that mean? What that means today we celebrate the fact that we have another chance. That regardless of what mistakes you've made, regardless of what you did last night, regardless of what you brought into this room, that if you choose, you can be forgiven of that. That you don't have to be shackled by that, live in slavery of that. That we can be set free, that we receive a fresh start. And even if you owe every other person on the planet Earth something, you can leave this room not owing God anything. Leaving here completely square with your creator, that we can do that. That the ripping of the veil, the effect of the veil being torn is symbolic of the fact that no longer does God reside in a building, God resides in people. What that means is there is nothing overtly spiritual about this building you're in. There's nothing spiritual about the, the, the iron and the metal and the mortar and the drywall. Nothing spiritual about that. And when people come into this place and they say, man, I really feel the spirit of God, that's not because of the building. That's because this place is inhabited with people who inhabit the spirit of God. That's why you feel the spirit of God. And what does that say about our relationship with God? No longer does God wanna hang out in the back room away from you. He wants to be here. This shows us how much God loves us. He wants to be with us all the time. 
that even if you have no friends, no family, nobody, you have God and that's enough. You're never alone. It shows us that you and I are of tremendous value to our creator. He cares about us. He thinks much about us. He loves us. And I love this. Look at what Paul says. Because we have this full access to God, we become adopted children of the King of Kings, which means we have the same benefits as our father, which means we have access to freedom and power, that we means we have access to contentment and joy and the fruit that the Spirit of God produces in us. That as Paul says, we don't have to live according to the flesh, which means we don't have to be slaves to our own desires that only lead us to destruction. We can be free of that. You can be free of fear. We have not been given a spirit of fear. We have not been given a spirit of slavery, the Bible says. Now, we often say in our culture, right, we think we're so free in the United States. We may be the most enslaved people that have ever existed, not by literal shackles or ownership, but we are enslaved to our addiction to affirmation. That's why social media is such a big deal. We're looking so hard for someone to value us and love us that we spend four or five hours a day getting the right picture and getting the right video and getting people to give us little hearts and thumbs up because we have become a slave to our own affirmation. We've become a slave to constantly impressing everybody, right? We're, we're, we've become a slave to making sure that we don't say the wrong thing because we're so worried about what everyone thinks of us. We are a people that live in bondage. And Paul says, right, that because we have access to God, we don't have to live like that. We are free from that. We don't have to live in this constant worry that we're impressing people or doing this correct all the time or, or popular or attractive to everyone or whatever the case may be, that we can live in true purpose. We can live in true contentment and fulfillment and peace because we've been adopted by the king. And not only can we live free now of the shackles and slavery of our culture and society, but because the veil was torn, not only can we be reconciled in our relationship to God, Jesus was resurrected because one day you're going to be resurrected as well. It is the promise of eternity that if we live in a relationship with Jesus, though this body may die, you're gonna be resurrected and you're gonna be given a glorified body that will live forever with Christ in heaven. And I love what Paul says. And if you come to church here, you hear me say it all the time, but I just really like saying it. The Bible says that when we get to heaven, we're not gonna be like you know digging ditches for St. Peter for eternity or like mowing God's grass forever. It's not gonna be like that. Jesus, Jesus, all throughout uh, Revelation 20 and 21, and then Paul right here says that when we meet Jesus face to face in eternity, we are co-heirs. Listen to that for a second. It's not about us just avoiding hell. It's about us inheriting heaven. That when we get to heaven one day, if we have followed Christ, Jesus doesn't hand you a shovel and he's like, go over there and start digging. Jesus says, it's yours. I've created this beautiful new earth. I've created this beautiful new universe. I've brought down this beautiful city for you to live in, and it's yours. Can I show you around? It belongs to you. Co-heirs with Christ. The death, burial, and resurrection just isn't salvation. It's inheritance. It's being co-heirs with Jesus Christ. You know what is amazing? And the fact that there was a resurrection even before Jesus' resurrection, it says it in Matthew. Jesus' resurrection was never about Jesus. I don't know if you know that or not. Jesus' resurrection was always about you. Let that sink in for a second too. Jesus didn't need to be resurrected. Jesus didn't need anything. He's perfect. He's complete. The reason Christ came and lived and died and rose again was so that you can also live properly and die and rise again. Because God loves you. And some of you may scoff at that or brush that off or be like, oh, it's church, they always say these kinds of things. But I don't think we hear it enough. 
And maybe there are some of you in this room that you don't feel valued or loved. And maybe no human has ever given you that. But I would stake everything on the fact that God sees you right now, looks down and says, I love her. I love him. And this was demonstrated through the cross. This was demonstrated through the resurrection. Because this veil that we've been talking about was torn, because it was torn, we can be put back together. Because that line that divided us is gone, we have full access to God. That there is no reason why this morning that you have to leave this place with any sin in your heart with any shame in your heart, with any guilt in your heart, that you can be restored, you can be forgiven. Not only that, because the Holy Spirit now dwells with those who follow Jesus, we are given the tools to go out into this crazy world and live a life that is honorable, live a life that has integrity, live a life that has purpose, because we're not alone. God is with us, and he helps us. Why in the world should you care, right? Whether you came here because this is your home church or whether you got manipulated because your mom wanted you to come this morning or whatever the case may be, why in the world should you care? Someone just felt some hard conviction there, didn't you? (laughs) Why should you care? You should care about everything we've talked about this morning because the world around you is drowning. We are confused. We are hopeless. We live in debilitating fear of everything. We're afraid of everything. We're offended by everything. We're afraid of everything. We're an aggressive society, are we not? Have you not noticed how aggressive we have become? We are an aggressive people. We lack identity. We lack purpose. We lack, we, 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 we lack comfort and we're, we're riddled with anxiety. Why? Because of the distance between us and God because there is a distance between us and our creator. But there doesn't have to be now. God has made himself accessible through the death, burial, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. And because of that access to God, we don't have to live in hopelessness. We can live in contentment and peace. We don't have to live in chaos. We don't have to live in aggression. We can live in love. We can be restored. We don't have to burn down bridges. We can build bridges. We can do this because God loves us and wants to walk with us. Why should we care? We should care because the world is more chaotic than it's ever been. Listen, it's hard enough to navigate life right now, let alone live in peace and contentment. If you have a kid in this room, if you have children, I feel like every day with my 13-year-old and nine-year-old, it's like a realignment because the world is so distracting and so off kilter and so chaotic. It's like every day we have, to like, we have to realign that path. And that's not just for kids. If you're an adult in here, man, there's distractions from every corner. There's false voices from every corner. There's so much bull crap around us that it is so easy for us to get diverted and off the right track. It has become very difficult to live lives of integrity, of honor. We should care though, Because again, like I said earlier, every college, every think tank, every survey, everything that you see right now is showing us that we are incapable of making it on our own. The more we say in the United States we don't need God, the more suicide rates go up, the more divorce rate goes up, the more aggression goes up, the more violence and domestic assault go up. You can look it up on your own. Every single negative thing that could be happening is happening simultaneously with the dismantling of faith in the United States. Why should we care? That affects your family. That's why you care. Now listen, I know it's Easter and we should have like pink rabbits jumping out of helicopters by now, but I love you so much. You guys are like, I wish I I I was getting rained down with chocolate right now instead of this guy. I love you so much though, we do not have time to keep our heads buried in the sand and just look at ourselves and say, we're good. Because we're not right now, we're not. We should care because the future is in jeopardy. Your friends, your family, you. So we have to start taking this seriously. Jesus died and was resurrected not only so we could avoid hell, but that we could be changed right now, that we could live differently, 
that our families don't have to fall apart. Our friends don't have to be lost. But here's the thing. We must choose to get off of the path that we are walking and we must choose to walk the way Jesus wants us to walk. Jesus is a gentleman, the Bible alludes to, right? If you read the book of James, it doesn't say Jesus kicks down the door. It says he stands at the door and he knocks. And we have to get up and we have to invite him in. Now again, I'm not trying to be like Debbie Downer on Easter, right? But here's the thing. Not only do we have to make a decision, we do not have forever to make this decision. In 2017, I did 17 funerals, 2017. All of those funerals except for one were people under the age of 40 years old. 2017 was a rough year. And I stood and I did all of these different funerals. And because they were young people, most of the people coming to the funeral were young. And I remember looking at all these young people, preaching the gospel and saying, listen, you're not promised tomorrow. As there was a dead body in the room. You are not promised tomorrow. You are not promised old age. We don't have forever to make this decision because every day we live, this is just logic. Every day we live, we are closer to our death. Every day we live, we are closer to the imminent return of Christ. And in the meantime, lives are falling apart. Your life may be falling apart. We have to take this seriously. But listen, I'll say it again because it's so important and someone needs to hear it. God loves you. You have access to God. If you're hurting, if you're drowning, if you're addicted, if you can't kick porn or if you can't kick your anger, if you can't seem to get past this, this, this roadblock you're hitting, if you would just humble yourself and if you would trust him and if you would open your mouth and just say the name of Jesus, he responds to that. He is accessible to us because he wants the best for you. And because the veil has been torn apart, we, we, we have access. And not only that, we, we are invited to be in a relationship with him to where the spirit of God dwells in us. And it saves us from the ramifications of our evil. That we don't have to experience the, the consequences of sin now. And we won't, have to, we won't have to deal with the consequences of sin for eternity that when the spirit is in us, it gives us direction. This world is nuts and it's hard to navigate, but with God's spirit in us, we know how to navigate it. It enables us to truly love people. We live in a culture right now that says the word love a lot, but it's a very conditional love. I love you if you vote the same way that I do. I love you if you believe the same way that I do. I love you if you're ideologically, uh, you know, politically correct, then I love you. It's a very limited love, and that's not a biblical love. A biblical love loves despite however the person is, whatever they believe, whatever choices they've made. And it is only by the power of God in us that we can truly see humans as humans. And listen, man, someone needs to hear this. It is only by having the spirit of God in us that we will understand our true value. The problem with our culture right now is we are trying to find our identity in everything except for the one thing we are made in the image of. And the reason why there is so much chaos and confusion and anxiety and depression and aggression is because we don't know who we are. And it is only when we find our identity in Jesus Christ, the one that we're made in the image of, that we understand how valuable we are, that we understand our worth, that we understand who we are, right? Would you bow your heads with me, please?